Sorry. So, um, how should we grade a thesis project? <laughs> uh, so, uh, thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the lecture of David Tseng, and which is co-organized by the Architecture Department and Taiwan GSD. Uh, when I think about David, I think about the term Mandarin. And by that, I don't mean the official form of Chinese language based on the Beijing dialect, uh, nor do I mean an orange. Uh, but instead, I think, of the, I think of the Mandarin as a 16th century colonial epithet as, in reference to the bureaucrat scholar of imperial China who is immersed in poetry, literature, Confucian learning, in addition to performing civic duties. In contrast to the Japanese uh, samurai warrior who cultivated Bushido, which is more, I guess, analogous to uh, the European chivalry, instead the notion of the Mandarin relies more on diplomacy than war and on the expectation that one should act as moral guides to the society at large. In some ways, it is reminiscent of the uh, mental aristocracy preached by Adolf Loos, who once said, quote, I'm a communist, but the only difference between me and a Bolshevik is that he wants to turn all people into proletarians, whereas I want to turn them all into aristocrats, end quote. Well, I think Lowe's definition of mental aristocracy was not referring to an elitism or of this socioeconomic based class society that arose in the Middle Ages, but instead to a person of the, at the peak of humanity who yet has profound understanding of those around him or her. So the impression of David as a Mandarin actually came from one, one of David's own quotes, where he said that Taiwanese architecture has always been rooted in a culture with a taste for the gentleman or scholarly architectural approaches, where it is constantly searching to redefine its own identities or identities. I just realized when I think about Mandarin, I wasn't thinking about David, but the architecture that David was talking about. So tonight we look forward to, uh, David to, uh, to hear David to elaborate on this where he would reflect on the different movements and the isms of architecture of Taiwan, the modern movement, postmodern movement, critical regionalism, or dirty realism, and how they decidedly differ from the modernism of China, Hong Kong, or Singapore. He will offer a glimpse of the recent grand projects in Taiwan, as well as covering the history and trajectory of Taiwanese architects' work. And then this will be followed by a conversation with Michelle Chang, where they will talk about the aforementioned movements of design philosophies in relationship to type. David is the university chair professor at the Faculty of Architecture and the Dean of College of Humanities and Social Sciences at National Chao Tung University in Taipei. Uh, prior to that, he was a dean at Donghai University in Taichung. Under David's leadership, the National Chao Tung University had won the 2014 and 2018 solar decathlons in Europe and Middle East, respectively. Uh, his team has also represented Taiwan in the 2016 Venice Biennale with the projects Orchid House, the Creative Action Base, and the exhibition Everyday Architecture Remade in Taiwan. Along with academia, David has served as a committee member of the Sustainability Task Force of Ministry of Education and the Consultant General of the Built Environment to the Mayor of the Cities of Taichung, Taipei, Xinchu, and Taoyuan. And the impact of this particular appointment is reflected in the renowned public projects such as Toyo Ito's Taichung Metropolitan Opera House, Remco House Taipei Performance Arts Center, Raisa Umemoto's Taipei Popular Music Center, the Taoyuan Museum of Art by Riken Yamamoto and Field Shop, as well as the Taichung Gateway Park by Stan Allen. David is also a practicing architect and the founder of the architecture practice City Crafts, an architecture office that received an Emerging Talent Award and the houses that he designed won consecutive top prizes in the Biennial of Taiwan Architecture House Award. Uh, in 2017, the French government honored him with the title of the Knight of the Order of the Arts for his contribution to art, architecture, and culture. Uh, and with all these qualifications, David is no question a Mandarin, uh, but uh, one of the most uh, outstanding thing on his resume in my mind is he's a distinguished alumnus of our MR program. Uh, tonight's lecture is titled The Uncharted Exclaves, Modernism and Other Isms in the Practices of Taiwanese Architecture. Please join me welcome David. Now I'm going to talk about how we do a thesis grading in Mandarin. <laughs> now, um, thank you, Mark, uh, for the incredible introductions. And thank you all for coming. Now, I have so many slides that I would be honest with you, but they just illustration to support my points. And I have these only few points to say. Uh, so give me 10 minutes. These are the points I would like to lay down. 
I want to say that modernism and other isms, such as postmodernism, there's actually quite life and well in Taiwan, at least. So well, well, what I'm going to talk about is the actions of these uh, modernism or postmodernism, and down to critical originalism, so on and so forth, and the reactions with these kind of movement. It's, in a way, you would say familiar with the Western um, world of what happened. But I would rather say it's sort of more of a defamilization of the movement that you probably know or what I learned when I was in GSD. So with that, I'm going to talk about the second point. Now, the second point is the struggle we always have with uh, expression through form and materials. And these are the, 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 the lifelong struggle that an architect will face. Now, Taiwan, in a way, and Taiwanese architects as well, has been struggling all along in the past, oh, I would say 120 years. These are the periods of time I'm going to cover, so you're going to cry. Anyway, so um, in these periods of time that we have been struggling with these kind of uh, expression of, or identity, if you will. Now these, is it to do with what people would then say zeitgeist, or more with genus loci or genus loci? In another words, is it about time? Or the expression is actually more about place or places? Or rather, we would use, and allow me to quote um, Kevin Lynch, what time is this place? Probably is the right question to ask, and we're going to see that. So that being my second point. And the third point um, is for those who has been to Asia, um, architecture proposed by Le Corbusier and other modern uh, masters, in a way still works. Probably not because of this single buildings, but because of the urbanism. That is the environment, that uh, the city environments, that, that the house, the, the buildings. So we're going to talk about the cities. Well, I'm going to quickly talk about how that works in Taiwan. Because as you probably know, about two weeks ago or about a week ago, Taipei has just been named by the ec economist um, intelligent unit to be the five most livable upcoming city in the world. And how, how did that work? What, what, what exactly pushed that is something that we would want to discuss. So in the Western canon, you would say, Public and private. Public means gong yong in Mandarin. And private, privately owned. But in Taipei, city is more of a gong yong, that is sharing. We share. Gong yong, in a sense, is that's public. Nobody owns it. Gong yong, sharing is we all own it. So we use this kind of public space. And when we use that kind of public space, the boundary or the line is gray. It's never black and white. It moves around. And so we're going to talk about that. Um, one of the things that you're going to, to notice today is that a lot of the architects that I'm going to talk about are GSD alums. Actually, I would say 80% of them. I want you to know that if I come to the right school. <laughs> and I also want to start with a project that was done actually by a student who's still here today and also co-working with a colleague of mine who's teaching with me now uh, who, who's, who graduated from here. So these are pretty much what I'm going to cover. And the last thing, if any, is about this kind of profession of architects. We don't have the words architecture, or in Japanese, kenchiku, or in Chinese, jianzhu, even back in the um, 19th century. It's not until in the 20th century the character were put together by Japanese, by Ito sensei. Not that Ito. Ito uh, Chongtai, Chuta. He invented the world, and he created term that we use today. And because of that, in a way, the scholarly architect is always someone that we look up to, who actually 
in a way. Um, he is the prime minister of a, of, of a country. And that was an article called Zi Ren Zhuan, The Master Builders, an essay that written in Tang uh, Dynasty. So that was the thing that I'm going to talk about now. So I'm going to just fly through these slides and bear with me if some of them has to be very fast because in a way it really just illustrates the point. So let's start. This encounter is something maybe you can say equivalent to PS1 in New York City. It established to encourage young architects practice. The project, as I mentioned earlier, was done by a student still here today. And uh, the talk tonight is a journey of how we get here to, to this place, to this time from 19th centuries. So I'm going to cash uh, cover 120 years, there's a lot of push and pulls of what architecture is about, or rather, should I say, it's more about contaminations of these ideas that was thought through in uh, the, all these movement. But it got shift and drift and adopted into the certain kind of practice in Taiwan. So that's what we're going to talk about. And at the end of the day, we'll probably look at some of these things that eventually what we'll call, uh, as uh, uh, Mark mentioned, dirty realism, not in the sense of kitsch or kish. Rather, it's more of ad hoc. It's more of a sort of a, a ready-made, but got the familiarizations through these kind of uh, uh, design process. So, with that, um, you, you sort of understand, I, I, I take on a structuralist point of view. I'm going to cut through the 120 years, and I'm going to have no time to explain all the theories, but using examples to cut through these, uh, these 120 years. And with that, we will also look at uh, some of these projects. And I'm going to use the children's illustration book, The Little House, to talk about the the, the, what happens in Taiwan um, architecture. So these are the A phases happened in the 120 years history in Ximending. We're going to talk about this. In, in 1932, when exhibition 59 happened in MoMA, more or less around the same time, there's another exhibition in Taiwan. It celebrates the 40 years uh, of governors of Japan in Taiwan. And if you look very carefully, this is talking about tea. Taiwan is much, much larger than its sizes. It connects Japan almost, and it's going down to the south. And that's what Taiwan at that time was about to, um, to Japan. In a way, 
what happened in that time and in eventually until this century is what happened to modernizations in Asia. And this is the map of that uh, expo. The expo took place around this, uh, the old town of Taipei. This is Qing Dynasty where you can see the city walls and with the gate. When the Japanese came, of course, they took down the city wall to get rid of the old regimes. And this is the uh, entrance of that expo building that they built. It happens right here. And right beside this was the city wall. It then became the very famous equivalent of Champs Elysees in Asia. It's called Three Man Alleys or Three Man Boulevards that go across. Later on, they put on the train. The railway goes down all the way to the south, connecting the island right there on top of the uh, thread lane. And in the year of 45, um, the American came. Along with the end of Japanese rule, Chiang Kai-shek came. Along with that, in the year of 49, the Great Retreat, uh, they lost China, so they came to Taiwan. And with so many people that he brought, oops, he has no place to stay. People has no place to stay, so the old soldier stays here. Chiang Kai-shek ordered his army to build a building to house all these refugees. And of course, modernism or modern architecture is the, 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 the ideal choice. And with this, it became a place. Rather than what you say, melting pot or uh, maybe a salad bowl, it's actually more of a compression pot, a hot pot, where with these military rules and with people from all over China uh, living together with uh, Taiwanese, it's, it, it made them has to it make them work together. This is something that just finished about a week ago. The public television is going to shoot a television series, and a lot of friends of mine, just like my generation, look at this and almost tears almost roll down to the eyes. And these are the record store where I get the pirate uh, beetles or uh, whatever you have over there, the record store. And this, of course, is uh, Thai with uh, John Travolta there with the railroad going through where it used to be the city wall. And of course, uh, Mr. Uh, General Chiang Kai-shek was there. And then the martial law left and after 30 years, they torn it down, turned it into, again, the Tree Boulevard. What happened, though, is that this is the place where people like I used to shop. They now shop in adjacent area, in Ximending. That's what I meant. And now the road is back like this. But we also try to create a park. So this is the eight phases in 120 years. And in a way, you know, the turbulent history that Taiwan has gone through from Qing Dynasty to the Japanese area, to the uh, uh, General Chiang Kai-shek's rule, and then to uh, lifting of martial law and with what happened today. And if you look very carefully, this is the park that is happening. Here's the island, here's the gate of that, uh, of that, uh, of that, of the north gate. I'm using the north gate as a symbol to talk about architecture. Before we came to this, it was like this with the city wall. And then it became, after the one town torn down, it became a single building. A single building is, would be dwarfed, and that's the whole idea of Japanese rule, by these huge roads. So the history in the past, the new architecture came about, the Japanese architecture. And then the Chinese or the international style, the modern building came about. It became an island of its own, just like Taiwan. Fortunately, it didn't go through this. This is the East Gate. Uh, the East Gate was dressed up 
because we're trying to have uh, Zhonghua Wenhua Fu Xing Yun Dong. In China, it was cultural revolution, so we have cultural renaissance. So it got itself dressed up, torn down, and became this. Fortunately enough, it didn't, but it has still have the slogan of a wartime painted on the face of this building. Because of this isolation, what happens in the late 70s, that Taiwan was forced out of United Nations. It has to reinvent itself. Technology is what happened with this elevated row and push this building aside in the crack and even got elbowed by this <laughs> five-way exit. Finally, five years ago, we decided that enough is enough. So we turned it down, became a building, an icon, a park where for people public underneath it, the high-speed rail, the MRT, the, the airport, uh, airport line going through it. And the building, again, became the self where people celebrate every October night. Uh, same time with Paris, we have white nights, that the night that people doesn't sleep. They roam around, they celebrate, they enjoy art, and what have you. In a way, the story about this north gate of Taipei is what happened to architecture. So I'm going to go through it very quickly. And this is a quote from Stan Allen. And I still use it because I like what he said. They celebrate uh, hybridity, impurity, intermingling, and transformation. And that was what I was talking about. And by the way, Stan Allen's essay uh, was published in the Harvard Design Magazine. Look it up, please. So this is the Japanese periods. If you look at it, uh, they tried to create uh, Western architecture with kind of a, a Western style, their, in, their own interpretations. And this is a park in Taichung, the first public park that happens in the early 20th centuries. And also try to have this mannerism uh, kind of architecture or something new, the telecom company, and also assembly hall something that is not exactly Western. It's a collage of a few things, but you cannot tell. And or, or maybe this too, it gets modernized and uh, became a symbol of, of, of progress. At the same time, they came and put down these infrastructures. Even with these kind of two railroad stations, they have two different style that they're trying to make. And finally, this is the first ever precast concrete tested in Taiwan, the, uh, the train depots. What I'm trying to say is Taiwan is the wild, wild west, or rather the wild, wild south for Japanese. The young architects came to Taiwan, Japanese architects, to try their chances to have a chance to become what they think architecture could be. So it's very progressive, and that was what happened. And after Japanese periods, we have this. This was actually by Anthony Stoner. Who is Anthony Stoner? Nobody knows who he is. He's actually an, a, a, an architect working in the American Engineering Corps trying to help Taiwan to establish its own defense system. He came, and at the nighttime, he took a moonlight job, and he did this chapel, St. Christopher Church. And it's beautiful, because inside it, yes, it's eclecticism, but inside it, it had this something similar to flying buttresses interpreted in a very modernist way. And the space and the light just, and the air just flow through. It still stands there. It, it was uh, erected in the late 1950s. Or maybe this. This is Bowen, Pritzker Prize winner. Came to Taiwan very early onward in his career, actually his very first project. And if you look at it, the building for Sequoia, with four towers, all have different expressions that was done by him. And these four towers, with a cross, with a crown, with a pigeon, and with a, 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 a rooster, uh, have four symbols and very beautiful sitting in this courtyard. And, or the Japanese architect, and now the Pritzker Prize winner, Kenzo Tange, came here for Sacri Heart High School for Girls and introduced the brutalist uh, architecture in the 70s. 
The project I like most is this one. This one was done in the 1960s, 61 to be, to, be, to be exact. If you look at it, it's actually a high school classroom with a chapel on top. It was done by a recent thesis uh, graduate. He just did his uh, PhD thesis, and this was his project. And somehow he built this building, and a lot of people think of it as a mixture of La Tourette and Hongshan together. Even with the staircase, the way it goes, reminds you of Kuruchat, of Le Corbusier's uh, houses in, uh, in South America, where one of the landing touched the wall, the other doesn't. The other doesn't because, in a way, he's going to the chapel. The priest is going to the chapel. So it's anti-gravity. Even with that detail, it's very Corbusier-like. And I love this building. It's unbelievable. And it's by a name, he's still alive, by the name of Da Hinton. Nobody knows him, but he's quite famous still in Switzerland. But he said he's no longer doing this kind of job, that project. He said, I don't believe in this project anymore, this kind of project anymore. And this is inside the chapel with this stained glass. Sort of, in a way, sort of like Adami's painting. Derrida's uh, The Truth in Painting talk about this. It's a mixture of pop and cubism, he said. So this is the project. Why am I spending so much time? In a way, modernism established a language for architects, even young as less than 30 years old, people like him. Le Corbusier gives you five points. And in a way, that's the success of modernism. You adopted it. And even at the young age of 30 years old, you will be able to deliver something astonishing. And that's so impressive. And these were done by foreigners who come to Taiwan by an invitation or something, or some of them even just did their uh, project and sent their papers coming here. And isn't it beautiful? You have pilotis, you have a chapel on top, and everything. And of course, because of the price, it has to be cheap, it has to be concrete. Now I want to talk about what we learn. So the first generation of uh, Taiwanese architects actually learned from this modern movement. This, you can see the Chicago school offices, you know, with the podium and so on and so forth, but picked up very beautifully <laughs> with uh, Ms. Fandrell's corner, they're done by concrete, because this is a concrete uh, company's uh, office building. And all this kind of experiment, the incredible structure, and the architect is barely 30 years old. Later on in his life, he will do this building, which I saw that we did the X site uh, in front of this building. This, again, also an experiment of the structure force and form, and it's the Taipei Art Museum. With the introduction of brutalism, of course, and the raw face concrete that Paul Rudolph did. And also with the eclecticism of South America, reminds you of a lot of people, uh, Oscar Niemeyer maybe, the mannerism, mannerist modernism. But then the same architect did this as well. And it's difficult to imagine that they do this and the other one at the same time. You have to understand the political, political stress underneath this because we're going back to China. We have to use this kind of Chinese style. And this assembly, uh, Zhongshan Tang, Dr. Sun Yat-sen Hall, is what it is about. So when you look at these kind of buildings, it's funny because it's symmetrical in the front. It has all these funky things in order to make it work in the back. And I like these kind of two faces that you know, right, collapsed and, 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 and hit each other. In a way, it's quite inventive. I enjoy that a lot. The most accomplished first generation modernist architect is Da Hong Wang. Graduated here, same year, with Ian Pei and Philip Johnson. This is his most accomplished and his favorite project. It's a monument to the moon landing. And done in the year of 65 to 69. He tried very hard to get it work and to build it here, right here in the state. It didn't get built. 
Uh, but this is the project he loved most. When he was young, he experimented with a prefabric pre uh, concrete uh, structure, the first curtain wall building. The most successful project of his is our housings and houses. This is his houses. And it sits right there. This was what the city was like. Imagine the shocking uh, ex uh, neighbor when they saw this. This was recently rebuilt right in front of the museum. This is the uh, old house uh, with old photos and how you look out. These are the photos he sent to his teacher, these three. Look up, uh, Walter Gropius, and he asked Gropius, is this too Chinese? I love it, I want it to be Chinese, he said. So the moon window definitely is Chinese. He did an addition because the two children, two kids came along. And if you look at this addition, it's amazing with the openings, skylights, gardens. It reminds you of Miss Van der Rohe's courtyard house with the court with the garden and courtyard. And even early in his early stage, he had this proposal published in American magazine, Interiors and Art and Architecture. If you look at it, he said, this is Chinese because you come in and then you have the house, courtyard in between with water, another house, a backyard. He even writes about how one should bath. The bath should, bathtub should be Sinked, and there, just like Roman bath, he will be able to enjoy the Chinese garden. He talked about this kind of cu culture. So this is the real gentleman architect that he is. He even published his student project, even back in that time in, when he was in GSD, he think about industrialization. One of the most painful projects of his is this project. This won the competition. And for him, the expression of structure on the roof is the way it should be. But General Chiang Kai-shek told him, no, I want a Chinese hat, Da He Dian, in Forbidden City. He struggled, he tried very hard, and he somehow just had to compromise. It became the most painful project of his career. But even at that time, he insists that the entrance should be like this. And in the sense, it was what happened in the original projects. He never compromised because this, with that entrance, it's not a real Chinese project. And he even wrote this statement, if you can read Chinese, he said, we have three choices. One is follow the Western. One is the classical uh, palace. And the other, revolutionary, the new Chinese style. Dr. Sun Yat-sen brought us the revolution. We have to do the same for architecture. Well, he, at the same time, he was trying to do this. So he was seeking his own idealism because of the reality. And that's, in a way, the sad fate of, Dr., uh, of, the, uh, of uh, Wang Dahong. He wrote a letter to Walter Gropius a year before Gropius passed away. And oops, and Walter Gropius wrote back encouraging him, quoting a Greek poet on the right hand, on the left hand side. If you look go to Gropius' house today, I did it 30 years ago, there was something that he, he sent Gropius. And I'm, I don't know whether it still sits there, sit there, but when I visited, it was there, right there, in the Gropius house. Gropius asked him to help him, and the other one, I am, to help him with a project that came along in China. It's going to be the 13th Christian university in China. It's called Huadong Dashe. It's uh, near uh, Shanghai. And Gropius said to him, I want something Chinese. I want something Asian, if not Oriental. And Gropius said, you know, with the long linking corridors is what going to be what I think could be Asian and, and university campus like at the same time. So Wang Dahong and I.M. Pei helped Gropius. They became a team. 
they proposed this beautiful project. And if you look at tech work, this project was done at the same time with Harkness Comma in Harvard Law School. And there are these corridors that was there. Again, back to this uh, proposal. It did not happen. I am paid to get and later on built it in Taiwan, became Donghai Da Xue, with still the corridor, low corridor that link up the campus. This is Donghai, the other is Hua Dong Da Xue. And if you have a chance, please come visit. It, it's very interesting. It's the first ever Westerner single house, the American ones, that happens in Taiwan. And if you look at these uh, dormitories, the arrangement of these dormitories is uh, what uh, they think. The first generation Taiwanese or Chinese architects think that what a scholar should like. They actually have a huge, huge study room where they play piano and, and, and bookshelves rather than having a big living room. It's very interesting the layout. They also always have a maid, by the way. A lot of people think of this project uh, as Jefferson's uh, uh, UVA. It's actually not the same. It has an excess, yes, but if you look at it, it, it disappears. It's western into a forest with a sinking amphitheater. And also at the end of the, uh, the, uh, this excess, the chapel shifted aside. This is what it looks like right beside an industrial uh, park today. But if you look at these uh, uh, president's office, it's P.O.T. with the Asian touch, if you will, the built versions of that. And the corridor that connects, and the courtyard in between, um, you think of Da Hong Wang. And also think of IEM's uh, thesis project right here with uh, Walter Gropius, the, the, uh, the museum in Shanghai. C.K. Chen who didn't have the money to come to GSD, Walter Gropius recommended him and have him work in Gropius' office, also work with IAM on this project. And if you look at these, this pinwheel, almost Bauhaus-like, in a way blended together very well with this Chinese or Asian expression. And he did this watercolor drawings. Uh, a lot of people think he's the first ever uh, able to mix this with a Western style in 100 years. This is that presentation drawings. And it's beautiful. It looked very carefully. And if you're ever in Donghai, this is that access, the liberal art avenue with the library, president's office, and even the chapel at the same spot, even though it's built it differently. It became a national symbol. This is a publication, architectural record, published this in 1957. This is how they built it, very difficult. They built it with waffles, shell structure, and it's very, very beautiful. It's the icon of a Taiwanese architecture for the longest time. And you think about how they built it. They actually built around the same time with Corpse and Zanikas, Philip Pavilion in the Expos. This is the loose chapel, the, the hyperbolic curve. This is the Philip Pavilion. This is the loose chapel. And this is what happened when uh, they held events. If you think about it, a lot of people was arguing who did this project. And if you think about it, maybe a lot of people overlook IM. But if you look at IM's projects, his own houses in the 50s, the expressions of structure is quite clear. And just like the way they had it in the loose chapel. CK Chan took the, the, the expression, the, the structure experience forward in the art center of Tonghai University. Very modern, very interesting. And also influenced his successor, another GSD alum, Han Pao Te, from here. And because of uh, the budget, they have to build it much more simple. And this takes us to Han Pao Te's career. 
He published all these magazines, 24 of them. It's called Environment and Form, or Jing Yu Xiang. It was published, if, to say this, an opposition magazine is probably too much, but definitely heavily influenced by architectural design when Ken Frampton was the editor. And he was a, he accomplished writers and thinker as well. He talked about the architecture in the East and West. He conquered both Taiwan and China. The book was just published in both simplified and traditional form. He even is the first one who introduced Lu Kang and translated uh, Bob Stern's A New Direction in American Architecture. And you see the change in his project. This was his fr whoops, first project. Oops, on the left-hand side corner, and on the right-hand side, lower corner, is what he more or less ended up to be, the kind of traditional vernacular Southern Hokkien or Taiwanese uh, projects. And you can see the change, the cutting of the angles, G Michel Giagala, Lu Kang, and then experiment with the local still cutting, and then ends up uh, something like this. And he also built, in one of his last projects, a, 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 a university using the traditional Taiwanese or Southern Chinese uh, style architecture. Around the same time, they both educated in the late 70s, 60s, when we have the turbulence of 68. At around the same time, Taiwan was going through difficult times. So, uh, C.Y. Lee, who educated in Princeton around the same time with Michael Graves and Peter Eisenman, well, he, they were there, his TA, he told me, it built it, uh, Taipei 101. Taipei 101 did not come from nowhere. He actually worked with IM on the Taiwan Pavilion. If you look at this, in, this is 1970 uh, Osaka Expo. It's very daring the experiment with structure. And he carried it with a, with a, a sort of postmodern Chinese style, if you will, with his later project, people call this the Transformers. <laughs> and then with the housing, actually beautiful and weather very well, much better than the, uh, the, 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 the modern building. Maybe it's because the tile that helps to protect the concrete. At the same time, there are other architects who also adopt this, this beautiful project at Youth Center in Taipei. These are actually two different projects. These, in a way, incredible achievement of structure, again, done by C.Y. Lee. And this, oops, sorry. This, on the right-hand side, is what we call classical Chinese. They are not the same, even though, in a way, uneducated, I look the same. They are actually fighting with each other. Each other. And Han Pao Te wrote an article saying, why did we choose the one to build Chiang Kai-shek's memorial? Why is that we could not choose the one on the left-hand side, which is much more, is a modern building? Why we couldn't do the one that up there, struggling, and we're doing the uh, National Palace Museum on the lower. These are the two polar of the project. And why are we ended up something like this? Uh, Han Pao Te asked and very fiercely in the magazine and in the newspaper. With his education came along his students. Um, on the left hand side, uh, Chris Yao. And uh, these are both Chris Yao. And again, uh, it's an expression, they left postmodernism. They seek a certain kind of expression through material, through structures, and what have you. This is uh, a, a, a gym and a library on the, on the, in, on the top, and uh, a gym on the right, and an expression of all the tectonic uh, elements that came together. Xu Chang, who also educated here with Val Work, same year, had also similar ideas. And he, in a much cheaper way, he has to do public projects, his expressions of how these uh, skywalk could connect um, Xinyi district together and how those will work in a different mode with, uh, with the size and so on and so forth. And recently uh, finished uh, Taichung uh, station, leaving the uh, Japanese aside, painfully uh, carving out a, 
a public plaza for him. And that's what he cares about. He is a scholar architect at the same time, and he did this beautiful book um, to talk about Taipei, the urbanism, and how they work. We're going to look at that at the end of the lecture. And then the second generation of boomers, uh, Xu Chang and Chris Yao are the first generations of baby boomers. And the second generation of boomers, who was here actually last semester, most, maybe most uh, uh, famous uh, Taiwanese architect at the same uh, at that time. He was on the cover of last year's AU magazine. And a lot of time, if you think about it, you couldn't figure out what he did. For instance, this footbridge that hangs in the infrastructure. And five years earlier, he built up a huge slow dam to cover up a dam because uh, the rapid water rise. And along this, this is the same, uh, later on he built this. A lot of time you can tell which project he built, how long did it take, so on and so forth, but this is the way Shang Wen worked. He walk, he worked, he used to work with the only distance that a bicycle can reach. And he keep on thinking how to make it even more public. And you think about these school, uh, kids where they have a safer pedestrian way. You think about a place for them to perform dance, folk dance, uh, provide pavilion that are covered. A lot of time you couldn't even tell if not for this. So, and this is the way he works. And a lot of times it's so strong, for instance, it builds up a big shade again, but with a gallery up there, the culture factory as they called it in Yilan, and also the ad hoc, sort of a addition in a way of the what we see in the Taiwanese uh, housing to become a senior citizens uh, care house. And we are the generation that's called the, fir uh, the young generations. Um, it happened 20 years ago. And if you look at this, this was actually done before Herzog de Morans, um, uh, 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 Philharmonica. And this is a chapel up there. Beautiful project by Yao Wei Li. And it looks like a rooftop addition, only this time it's a chapel. And this is my own project. You can see where it is. It's right here. <laughs> the client comes to me. He said, you know, I, my uh, parents bought this old street house, walked up. I want you to do it for me, but you need to put down all the iron bars to make it safe for me. So this is what he, she has. Also to help to, uh, to, 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 to send shades because it's facing uh, right to the west. And also a GSD alum from here, Alex Mo, he proposed a public park uh, be, be Besides, oops, besides the first ever military housings, and in in a very interesting sort of a landscape way, he proposed this public grounds for the students or for the kids or for the public to sit here and listen to bands play and to become a steps, a very slow steps, or. Wen Jay, another uh, alum from here, he gave Xinju a place. He be transformed this gateway, which has been there for the longest time, nobody knows what to do, become a square, uh, a public plaza where you can hang out uh, from the uh, underneath. There's a, actually a river that goes through that covered up. He digged it up, he, he discovered it, and he made it a public space right there in the center of this row. He also goes out to the countryside, look at these old farmhouses, and try to protect them, and try to uh, renovate them, if you will. It was uh, another uh, different architect, Guo uh, Zhongduan, uh, 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 a very brilliant woman, um, who uh, went and rebuilt the shade that left from the Japanese period for the timber factory. Or another alum from here tried to make a, uh, a public 
exhibition space from the wood crate. And another architect graduated from GSD and did this culture center in near Kaohsiung. It's called Datong. Experience with fabric, experience with form, experience with light and wind and, and, and what have you. Another uh, graduate from here, Michael Lin, very accomplished. He, he does high-end building, high-end house. But he also works on public project. This is a Japanese market place. And he renovated it and became a place where you come in and you can uh, sit down to have culture events or to mingle, oops, sorry, with the, with the still the, the market outside of this building. This is the first ever uh, place where they, uh, uh, they serve uh, ice drinks. Yeah, it was done in the Japanese time, uh, cube. Yeah, the, the ice making factories right inside, used to be right inside here. So we are now coming to the, the final uh, two topics of my talk. These are the younger generations. And they came to practice in the 21st century. And they went through, a lot of them, in high school or in university of September 21st earthquake. And with that, it changed their thinking about architecture permanently for me. They're different from my generation. They're the one who's coming up. They take up whatever they had because boomers like us, we're not going to give up our stage. So they have to figure out what to do. And a lot of them went to help to build um, you know, villages for Aborigines or for this, in this case, for the after earthquake. Uh, and they experiment with wood, with recycled plastic, another GSD alum, um, Huang Tianzhi, Arthur Huang, and this one, a beautiful game changer with Mr. Chow here that change our idea of what installation architecture is about, at least in Taiwan. And I would say it's enormously, enormously successful. It's helped to cart out a different way for the one follow it and the one that's coming this year. We're, we are looking at it. And it's done by two GSD alum. One is teaching with me, the other is uh, still here. And this is another project that used the kite so after this one, they, they, they disassembled and gave it to the school kids. And this is the one that follows the Miss Encounter with bubbles, a performing venues uh, for using the, uh, the constructions, uh, uh, what do you call it, the scaffolding and what have you. And they also, because there's so little projects around, they have to take up exhibitions. This is an exhibition I commissioned. And this young architect experiment with paper and fiber to create space, to create gallery space, so on and so forth. And uh, it, it was sitting in an old building that done by the Japanese, a uh, simple building. And yet, he was able to create both space, sometimes it's four people, and sometimes um, very tranquil. These are the projects that nowadays, these young architects, usually around the, their 30s, uh, worked on. For this one project, it's a basketball court, not even big enough for NBA games. So we can, they can only have three on three. But with that, they create a place for the neighborhood people to come and to have a rest. And this is a public project, very little funded. They took it up. And also a student of mine, look at these two meter wide space. The two meter wide seven foot, it's the, the, the size of, a, of Japanese timber. That's why they have this very small, small lot. And these small lots inside it, it creates this little um, artsy place for them to have a way of getting people together, getting neighbor together. And the city wall, it's hard to tell where the, where the building wall is because uh, they, he tried to make it sort of, uh, sort of arcade-like what you see it in Taiwan. He also 
work with an artist to bend the wood to create a place where people checked in to create <laughs> flows on Facebook and Twitter and what have you. And these are the girls that went up there and uh, shows people and they sort of got it. Or these abandoned houses um, from Tonghai University, this young teacher, they came to create co-working space and free lectures for the neighborhood. And this is the kind of project that they worked on, they nurtured. And for me, we also worked on what you uh, just heard from Mark, the sort of uh, solar decathlon. We took up what these rooftop addition and think about the settlements in southern China. And we tried to create artist a village on rooftop and an engineer uh, Taiwanese university professor helped me to calculate how you can move this around. And this is my wife. Uh, she, when she just first graduated, she has no money. She had to rent the top floor where it's hot. But somehow, these are the young artists or film company that uh, established in Ximending. And we try to imagine how that could be with energy, with the recycled material, and we called it Orchid House, and look at these. So many people lined up to see my building. So, It's now a national education center for environment, for renewable energy, and we rebuilt it right there at TSMC, a public park, and we receive a guest. I think in the past almost 20 years of solar decathlon uh, history, only two projects gets rebuilt. One is Delft University, and the other is this one. And this one is for public purpose. And these are the things Wang Xu was thinking about when he took up this as well. Or Xie Yunjin, was, this is the three meter fire alleys. They try to address this. And this is what we talk about, about dirty realism, the boundary between public and private is never clear, or rather, like I said, it's not about gong gong, it's about gong yong. It's that something you can have these uh, uh, gatherings, but the God is right there watching next to you underneath a bridge, an infrastructure, a highway bridge. Maybe in a very advanced, civilized society, this would not be allowed. But in a polytheism society, is that how you say that? Or pantheism uh, society, where God and people and saints, we are all the same. We co live together, even though sometimes they live underneath the, uh, the, the highway bridge. It takes up the row houses, it takes up the balcony. And even sometimes a road goes right through it. The public assets road, it sits and rides on top of a public assets road. How that was done, I have no idea. Building permits, I have no idea. But this happened. Nobody would fuss around with God, trust me for, for that. And, and this as well. This is a, sh a shrine already, a temple, right there. Is the house stuck right here or there? Nobody knows. But since the God lives there, we better be good to him. And that's the way it goes. And again, the public and private, or rather uh, the space, uh, is never quite clear where it is. And this is what Xu Zhang wrote in his book, Taipei Unveiled. It discussed this incredible uh, mixture of urbanism that in a way, in a re reminiscence of this famous painting that was in Da Dao Cheng, with all these going at the same time, and the row house is always a mixture with different functions, different floors, and everything. And when Kohas first visited Taiwan in 1994, he looked at this and unbelievably uh, these different functions that are there. And remember, that's the bigness, the idea of what it's about with this incredible different mixture in one building. And he called this the unbearable paradise for him. So it's never a gnarly plan, it's black and white. If you look at these figure grounds, Xu Chang argued, you could never figure out what it's about. He did a research 
it's got so mixed together. It has everything, and that's why the urbanism works, he argued. A very interesting book. You would try to get a chance to get home to, to that. An architecture view of how these kind of uh, very incredible mixed use and misuse, M-I-S, and mixed use, M-I-X, uh, creates a lively urbanism. And that is exactly what Remco has looking when he did TPAC. How close is it with the original proposal? It's amazing. It's going to have its soft opening this October 10th, 2020, 10, 10. I think that's a good date. And they, he, he brought the idea of what we saw at the temple with these theaters into the lower level, create a street, go straight to this building. And when he proposed this project to the jury, he also talked about how these people would come from these uh, elevated MRT station. And that's exactly what Toyo Ito uh, told us when he was in the competition. He wanted to use the idea of Taiwanese arcades, where Japanese made it a call to have arcades all around the city. So they have to have this arcade because it's too hot. So it's south, so you have to walk underneath the arcade. Also, it helped to protect you from the rain. And he wanted to push it. And he created this building. And if you go on opening days, it floods with people in front of the plaza, going to the building, go to the top of the rooftop, so on and so forth. And this is the illustration he, he showed. So although it was, in a way, an interpretation, and he's the one who translated uh, Colin Rose's Mathematics of Idea Vela and Transparency into Japanese. So he, Look at this, and this is what he called, sorry, I let the cat out. Um, this is a very abstract structure form, and yet inside it, it's lively, because this is the kind of Taiwanese urbanism he experienced, very different from Japan, and he loved it. And it's the same urbanism that Stan Allen took when he worked on this Taichung project, where I commissioned him, and and he did a beautiful project, and it's happening. It's really happening. And it's my ugly handwriting where I had to know that he's going to publish it. I'll write it better. Same thing with RUR. It's unfortunate this project is no go, but the experiment with bamboo structure is just beautiful. Jesse did it, and Nanako did an incredibly beautiful project. And this, in a way, opened up to the international competition that I mentioned. These early projects of RUR and by Narihiko Deng, the Orientation Center for Samung Lake, very cheaply built and yet beautifully done. Happens in 2002, I think the competition was first won and build it earlier. So this is the conclusion. And I would quote again with Jamison's uh, dialogue with Michael Speaks. It's striking, in a way, because it's a 120 year compression that you experience all this. And in a way, it also have an experiment to it. It's, no, it's not Hong Kong. It's not Hong Kong. Hong Kong, with its capitalism and the English colonial style, would not allow this to happen. The kind of mingle, the mixed use, the intermingling. It's not Singapore. And definitely China compressed it into the past 30 years. But it's a different story because the scale is different and so on and so forth. But this is what I see I can offer as a Taiwanese speaker nowadays in here. And Taiwan, if you allow me three more minutes, it first entered Chinese history in the third century. Linguistic has it, it's also where the Polynesian people come from because the Aborigine language is so complicated in Taiwan, similar and yet different. So they went as far as Easter Island and Madagascar. And when I went to Renzo Piano's Chibau, I went there to the museum and I saw this. Oops. Ooh. Ooh, sorry. It's the same. It's the one we had for the Aborigine Dawu people. 
exactly the same sitting right there in there. So Taiwan is a very interesting place. In the 11th century, it was just a sign. And in the 17th century, it was broken into three islands. I don't know why. <laughs> the, 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 this guy is a Jisoo a missionary. And he came to China, and he drew this. And just like the one they did in Portuguese, three different parts. Maybe it's because the river. And it entered the Western memory with the father or the further adventure with uh, Robinson. And it's, of course, a fiction. He thinks up what uh, Taiwan is about. It also became a scandal when someone has not been here and write a, a fake up uh, a discussion of what uh, Formosian is about. The left one is a Western imagination. The right one is uh, illustrated by a Taiwan, uh, a Chinese visitor. And these illustration was uh, based on the, uh, the, so the chopstick, he used two hands. So very interesting. And, but these are the Aborigines, and these are the Han people who lived in Taiwan. And there's a lot of words between the Dutch, Portuguese, Dutch, Spain, and the local people, but also there it was a rec record. In one uh, Dutch uh, report, he gave a feast to the Aborigine, and they sat down in Westerner style long tables, and it's all true according to him. So this is Taiwan. If you look at this map in a deer skin, this is a, a, by Dutch with a, a Zealand deer. And the local, and in a Chinese map, it's very interesting. It's all about qi kan lo, or, or qi kan. And when you put them together, here's a chapel. It's different because it has a podium, it has a cross. Here is a temple, and they're describing the same, same thing, even though one is on the west side. The other is on the east side. But there you have it. This is Taiwan. In a way, it coexists. A very interesting place and a very interesting architecture and urbanism happened. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for your lecture. I don't know if you need a minute. It's a lot. And now you have to talk some more. Um, but I learned quite a lot. I really have two questions slash comments that I'd like to kick off with first, um, maybe one at a time. I found it really striking in the, let's say, first part of the lecture where um, basically pre uh, the, the current generation of architects, where I understood that to be um, maybe marked by two different kinds of experimentation stylistically. Um, on the one hand, there was the what you were calling the kind of mannerism, um, the influence of the different styles on the exterior. And so um, let's say the the temple plus the postmodern. So that's all happening on the envelope, and that operates on a one particular uh, political dimension architecturally, one sort of symbolic dimension. And then there is another, which to me was quite interesting, where um, let's say that the modernism was adopted but transformed and became hybridized through type. So the the house. Um, and the, the persistence of, let's say, the courtyard house type or the persistence of the rooftop building was what uh, sort of operated in a kind of political dimension with program and form. Um, so I guess my question is um, if 
if that is, uh, if you would agree with that kind of dichotomy in terms of the experimentation and, and how much that um, difference is, I would say, let's say gen generational or uh, taken on as a kind of symbolic or political project. Indeed, it has to do with the changeovers of uh, politically what happened. Let me talk about C. Y. Lee. I, he's actually someone I respect a lot. I know that a lot of people think that it doesn't make sense to have this kind of figure of architecture, but he believes in that. He can go on for two hours looking at the character that the Asian, uh, Koreans, Japanese, I want to, we wrote. And he would explain that, you know, if you look at it, it has space in it, and it, it's a figural thing. Why should we use the, uh, you know, the alphabet? So he insists, and he believed that the culture dwelled in these character and in this figural form. I do not share that belief. But you have to understand, he went there when Taiwan was going through a very difficult time. And he has something, and at that time, Taiwan equivalent to China, the free China. So for him, he needs to find a way to express himself. And I think he got that. It's a generation thing, for sure. Han Paute, on the other hand, he was already translating Corbusier's and one of the very first books introducing Kobu and Lukan when he was still a student, an uh, undergrad. So he was deeply in thinking of these concepts. And, and if, even though in a way that he shifted, but it also rooted in what he believes culture in these kind of expression, very different, even though some of you might think it's the same, very different from, 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 uh, from CY, the, the more of a formal uh, structure, of a character and of that building, for instance, Taipei 101. Uh, it, it actually makes sense, um, the, the, the way, and it's an incredible extreme of, uh, of uh, structure-wise. I was really fascinated by the translation of Korb's work into <laughs> Taiwan. I, I was thinking about it more as a kind of um, a model, especially that in the way that the, the more like sort of uh, tropical work was was translated, but also, I, I suppose what I'm trying to get at is um, the the persistence of certain um, aspects of Taiwanese architecture, or kind of dispositions, revealed through the architecture, and um, if if that has any sort of um, let's say political dimension or symbolic dimension, etc. So. Um, in many of the earlier projects you showed, I noticed that the the moon window was persistent. Let's say, like the the, the model of from the Western was always adopted. That that, that certain things kept going, um, and so that was I was just say fascinating to me. It's fascinating that um, Da Hong um, has to write to Gropius and saying that these are the three shots snapshots, just snapshots, that I took of the house, do you think it's too Western? And if you do, that's the way I want it. And, uh, and Gropia is saying that, you know, you don't need my proof, I like it. Eventually, then, and they, earlier they worked on that uh, Huadong Da Xue project with the thing, so it's very interesting. It's, it's not like the Gropius you would know. If you think about it, people think about what it grow is as that this you know international style, even though it's uh, Hitchcock or Johnson, but he's willing to adapt to the environment. What it grow is so it's very interesting thing that's happened there. I also wanted to add a few things about the uh, uh, Dong Donggong. Uh, the Saint uh, Joseph, I, I think I forgot because of time, to forgot the name of the high school. The Joseph Senior uh, Technical High School is for the Aborigines. They they have no money, so these uh, these priests, if you think about those four, it all has to do with church. When they established this, and let me tell you, it's the 
best technical school where you train carpenter, where you train dance. They kept winning awards, even though it's, it, it's just uh, senior high. And uh, again, the St. Joseph, if you think about it, corpse language can be transformed and quite successfully for someone who's less than 30 years old. And it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful project. So uh, small as it is and cheaply built as it is, um, it's, again, that says something about the powers of modernism. I know people say all these things about Pomo, about modernism, but if you look at it, you know, it could be transformed and dotted and uh, alive and kicking and well, uh, the way that it works with the, what they call uh, critical originalism or dirty realism. I try not to label that, but it doesn't have to do with these contaminations of climates, with uh, programs, with, uh, with no exact boundary between public and private, but it worked. So that's the beauty of it, I think. And then I think the second observation maybe I had from the talk was that maybe I would say that there was a, a large break uh, from that maybe era of architecture to what you were saying is the kind of current. Um, in maybe um, at least in the I guess formal or uh, aesthetic quality of the architecture had me much more to do with the urban fabric of Taipei or Taiwan itself, which seemed to be less of um, less present. I would say in the the first half. So um, I wanted to maybe touch on uh, let's say the, the really compressed small projects and the impact of. Um, the zoning or the just the general, uh, sorry, legal um, aspect of just how Taiwan is set up. Um, if that makes sense, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, uh, the difficulty of young architects as anywhere else in the world in here is that trying to get a project. So they have to take on whatever they got. And a lot of time these, um, are done in a way that's sort of a interpretation of code a lot of times and uh, with a lot of uh, you know um, additions and and what have you happened uh, for instance um, the the orchid house that I mentioned at the very beginning when we were proposing it I just remember because uh, my grandparents my granddad he um, learned uh, he has this penthouse on rooftop, and he uh, nurtured orchid. And my wife also lived under this incredible, difficult situation. And we're just trying to make it work. And by these, we argue that if you transform this into solar panel and we use recycled material, you know what happened, actually? Taiwan changed its code now. It's now legal to have this addition Right there, if it puts on the solar panel and you have you know, space for escape, I wouldn't say it's my achievement, but definitely happened after we uh, won uh, Urban Design several awards of, in these competitions and it got on the newspaper, it was broadcasting in PBS and everything, um, uh, public televisions, and, and the mayor actually had me and discussed with me that what are there to use, what kind of uh, fabric, uh, to, uh, heat proving or recycled glass. So you, you can never tell. Uh, again, this is the something I want to share as well. Uh, you are, when I was here, I was less than 30 years old, but then uh, these are the students I work with. They're around the, your same age and we were able to change the code. We were able to tell them that this is the way Taiwanese people live rather than you know keeping it illegal why don't we transform that and 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 it's quite empowering stories that i want to share and these young architects i don't know where the up up mysticism come from for me <laughs> i don't know how they survive <laughs> even i commissioned that paper exhibition i yeah but it's you guys are architects and uh, somehow you know and, and maybe I could um, refine that comment a little bit better. Um, 
And thinking about you lecturing today, I looked up, you know, the and I read the Jameson essay on Taipei, and um, in it he compares um, Taiwanese cinema to Chinese cinema, particularly new wave cinema in Taipei to fifth wave uh, Chinese cinema as indicative of a kind of aesthetic disposition. Um, and in particular, he points to the 1985 film Terrorizers by Edward Yang as something that uh, can characterize, let's say, the, the aesthetic disposition of Taiwe, Taipei. And so in that movie, it's a series of overlapping narratives, and you can't tell. There's no sort of like linear timeline. You can't tell what goes first. And it's a series of superimposed interiors. And it's very kind of um, confusing, right? And that, to me, really um, resonated with how I perceive of Taipei, yeah. generally, because of the way in which the zoning produces uh, public slash private spaces that are semi-legal, let's say the arcades. And to, to me, the break um, in the new generation of the projects that you showed was responding to that condition that is native to um, Taipei, as opposed to responding to these sort of styles from um, the West. And I, I found that quite fascinating. It has to do with density as well. Um, when um, in the 1949, when uh, we've just that people just came from mainland China, Chiang Kai-shek brought with them. Taiwan was not like this, the density. And uh, because of the density, it has to figure out a way, just like the way I showed Chonghua a marketplace, that uh, the squatters was there, because all of a sudden, you need to have a place to stay. And that became what happens in the city of Taiwan. So. Um, yeah, that's that's why you see these differences, and uh, also the earlier projects are pretty much commissioned by uh, fairly well-to-do people. A lot of them, and uh, Da Hong uh, came from a very good family. He was trained very, very well. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, he was actually studying Cambridge University uh, architecture before coming to Harvard because of the war and all that. So yeah, these are the true uh, gentleman architect or scholar architect, uh, the previous generations. It's a, uh, it's a nobleman's profession. <laughs> no, not anymore, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't know if we're gonna take questions or if we're gonna close it out. What do you think? Okay, we can take a few questions if you have any. By the way, just something, Brown maybe would like to have this. Edward, Edward Yang, uh, Michelle just mentioned, wanted to become an architect. He wanted to become an architect. And he wanted to study Donghai. But in the entrance exam, he did it too well. He came to Chatung University. At that time, I was out there. There's no architecture program, so he had to study engineers. But all his life, he wanted to become an architect, and he couldn't become an architect. He decided that he'd become a filmmaker instead. As you were talking, I was trying to figure out if there's some way that I could become Taiwanese. I thought you maybe have the, the best Medicare system. Great. I thought the easiest way to do it might be if you just adopt me, and we, but we can work that out after the talk. Uh, my, my question has to do with patronage. It has to do with the fact that um, maybe a, an oversimplified definition of the architecture you're describing, but architecture seems to be in your setup always in a state of becoming. It's always, there isn't, there's nothing fixed there, and its vibrancy has to do with that fact. In that moment, the role of a patron is quite interesting because the patron doesn't know the shape of architecture either. And I'm wondering if you see, especially with the things that you've been involved in, a particular role of the patron in your context or in this moment, say. I can speak in two different modes. 
uh, the first, please, please allow me as a, you know, my little practice. I do public works, I, I'm a juror, so I do not take public commission. I was forced to take on houses, um, interiors, and what have you, bookstore. I, I did a sleep bookstore once. So, and, and because of that, I have all these people come to me, and again, like you said, has no idea what architecture is about, and nor were they like filthy rich or, you know. And for instance, that one that came to me just say, I want iron bars. You give me iron bars. I say, you don't need iron bars if you want to. I don't do iron bars. He said, you're a good architect. I want to do an iron bars. And, and, and so we argue with each other a lot. And uh, these are the kind of clients. And then I, because it's a mixed use, the lower two floors are dentist, the upstairs are it's his house. So I, I use a circular stairs to separate and create a balcony, the arcades on the third floor. It's the same depth, same dimension for him to change his shoes to go back home. At least a man can change his shoes when he goes back home. And then when I make that circular stairs, all the people, the neighbor came up and watched that, and he said, why is this guy putting a tank, a water tank? Taiwan has all these water tanks on top. Why is this guy putting a water tank inside a house at the second floor, this guy? The architect is crazy, so on and so forth. So they have no idea, but because of that, you have possibility of interpreting the programs, the form, and what have you. Now, when I work as a, um, a Consultant to the mayor, I listen to the mayor, and I select the jurors. Moison was there. I invite Moison. I invite uh, these different, um, you know, architects from um, from Japan and from, and we sit together. We discuss before the briefing goes out. Sometimes, not always, we discuss what kind of buildings we would want to be. And we sort of have an idea of how to reach uh, to the public of the kind of buildings that we would want. And so, in a way, the patronage, which the government, uh, in a way, listen to the professionals because uh, uh, in, a, in a very interesting setup, that's, that's that li little, power as we have as a technocrats, somehow they, they, they listen to us. And that's the way we got the, uh, the, call, the gateway um, competition, which um, the uh, uh, Dan Norihiko uh, won. Um, actually, uh, Jim Corner uh, and Stan, uh, Phil Operation, we collaborate on a, a project that project fell apart, just like the Alishan project. But we, 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 because of that, we, we, we were able to sort of uh, seek and, and reach out and create a certain momentum for the, uh, for the politicians. And that's what happened. I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering the questions. Helpful. Thanks. of the three promenades, right? And later as you go on to kind of describe the work of more modern architects contemporary to this time. One thing that I wanted to ask is kind of thinking about this modern gesture where there's a positioning of architecture as a tool for initiating and as a tool of transformation in particular, thinking about kind of like the urban node. Um, my question is, do you kind of see like the deployment of modernity or kind of the development, whichever word you choose, does it correspond with this negotiation of kind of like type or like urban node? Like does kind of as, especially with the case of like with Taiwan, there's a mixing of kind of like um, traditional vernacular culture with kind of this onset of like a mixing pot of like, you would almost say colonial practices, and, but also other cultures like is this kind of modern gesture to trans like architect within this modern gesture of kind of like accounting for all these different feeds into architecture of like a vernacular of a local? This is like 
how do you kind of balance or take what is your thoughts on that the things in taiwan is that i'm trying to portray and this is exactly what happens in taiwan we have aborigines and we have taiwanese um, they are uh, poor people or criminals they have to escape from China 300 or 400 years ago, and probably my ancestors are one of them. And we have what we call the latecomers, uh, the, the 49, uh, the great retreat from all over place in China. They all came. And then we now have these newcomers, what we call the bride, uh, that came from uh, other Asian places. And, uh, and, 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 and the make of these places is so different. And a lot of times I run into people who has very pointing nose and curly hair and they say, you know, my joke around, that, you know, my uh, ancestor is uh, Dutch, the red hairs, uh, so, so, so to speak. So this, the map that I showed also tried to sort of tell the, explain the, the multiplicity of the place. And it's just something that I found it different from Singapore. Hong Kong is quite interesting, but that's a different story. It also has all these things, but uh, minus uh, Aborigine maybe. But, but it's very different from, from other uh, Mandarin-speaking world. And uh, that probably creates these kind of, uh, this kind of, you know, Easy going and accepting these, uh, and but by saying easy going is not so true as well. Um, we argue a lot for the human rights of Aborigines and uh, same gender uh, people, uh, same you know, transgender people. We we legalize the marriage and so on and so forth. So it's a very interesting place to be a lot of time. And um, I think that sort of make Taiwan what it is. I have a friend who teaches at National Singapore University, an architect historian. He's a Malaysian. And he told me first time he came to Taiwan, the re only reason he fell, into, fell in love with Taiwan is that uh, he came to Taiwan on high speed rail. And he listened to the broadcasting in Mandarin, in Taiwanese, in Hakao, and in English. And in MRT, you even hear Japanese. He heard Hakao. He said his tears were almost rolling down the t eyes because he's not allowed to say Hakao as a, a legal language uh, back his house. He only heard it in his house with his dad. And this is a place that allowed this and broadcasting it. So maybe in a way that's the nature or the attitude we have been colonized and ruled by Qing, by, and we, in a way, we, we live with them. And we actually, you know, I love my Japanese friends. I have no problem with that, so so far, so, but, yeah. Um, I just, um, for our students, you know, when, I think after you graduate, when you do your first project, I'd like you to send me three images of your work, okay? <laughs> and ask me if it's too Western, all right? But, uh, Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Michelle. It's great. Thank you.